The Adventist world in which I grew up was steeped in morality. We knew very clearly what to do and what not to do. Now, it wasn't that we never let our hair down, but it's kind of like the storyteller Garrison Keillor says. Even when we let our hair down, not much happened because our hair was pretty short. (laughs) Now, it is true there were times when people got really serious about sinning. They got serious about it to the degree that we all knew about it. They seemed to take Tony Campolo's advice when he says, if you're going to hell anyway, you may as well go with a degree of dignity. And so they tried to go with a degree of dignity. But nevertheless, it was a world that was steeped in morality. At times, people would get caught with their hands in the cookie jar, but usually it was health food cookies, and so even that was somehow spoiled. I suppose that's the reason why, in my college years, when an Adventist songwriter named Brad McIntyre wrote a song called The Adventist Blues, that I connected with what he said. Here are some of the words of that song. Now, I don't drink and I don't swear. I don't take dope or have long hair. I go to church each week. Oh, yes, I do. I never eat before going to bed. I'll drink a glass of juice instead, and I jog each day at least a mile or two. Now, all my life, I've been pretty good. I've always done just what I should. My parents were missionaries overseas. I got all A's in Bible class and studied hard so I could pass, and even bought my books from the ABCs. Well, the song continued in that vein a vein that was familiar to me, to which I could deeply relate. But then at the end, I was pulled up short by where the song went, where the song ended, what the song asked. Yes, it says, I found the church where I belong. I don't think I've done anything wrong for at least two years or maybe three. I know I'm walking in the light. Sometimes I'm bored, but that's all right because there's a crown in heaven just for me. But recently, I've heard some talk. They say you need a closer walk with Jesus if I'll only let him in. Well, I'm all for that. I'll give it a try, though I often wonder why and ask myself, just where does he fit in? It was that last question, just where does he fit in, that haunted me. I wondered about that. I knew the rights and wrongs, the do's and don'ts, and the rules. Had broken many of them, no doubt. But I knew religion and knew about morality and wondered just where does he fit in. It left me with the distinct impression that there was something about this faith, this Christian faith, this Adventist faith that I was missing. You've probably had an experience like that, wondering, what am I missing? What am I not seeing? Am I blind? Jesus had an experience like that with the disciples. It came just after the Pharisees had come to him and in a rather arrogant manner had said to him, Jesus, we want a sign. Show us a sign. And Jesus said to them, you're not getting a sign. And then he got his disciples in the boat and they went across the lake to the other side. On the way across, the disciples got to talking. They realized they didn't have enough bread with them, and they were talking among themselves, quibbling about how they were going to eat. In the middle of their conversation, Jesus says to them, on the theme of bread, beware of the yeast of Herod and of the Pharisees. Well, once he's preoccupied with something else, they talk again and say, it must be because we didn't bring bread. That's why he told us that. He's worried about what we're going to eat. And Jesus again cuts in and says, Really? Are you really? You don't get it? He said, What about the 5,000 I fed with just a few loaves and fish? How many baskets full of leftovers did you pick up? Twelve. And what about the 4,000 I just finished feeding before we started across the lake? How many baskets full did you pick up? Seven. Do you not get it? 
Do you not understand? Are you still blind? Now, it's right on the heels of that experience. While his question is still hanging in the air, do you not get it? That they land and a group of people come bringing to him a blind man. They come pressing the blind man to the front because they want him to be healed. It is at that moment in the Gospel of Mark, the 8th chapter, that comes what to all appearances is the most bizarre incident in the life of Jesus. Certainly the most bizarre incident in his healing ministry. It's recorded, as I said, in Mark's Gospel, the 8th chapter. I want to read to you what happened. Remember what's hanging in the air. Don't you get it? Are you still blind? Verse 22. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hand on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. Jesus takes him by the hand, leads him aside, spits on his eyes, And says, okay now, read the top line of the chart on the wall. And the man says, what chart? He says, the one on the wall. What wall? And Jesus says, Houston, we got a problem. Can you see anything at all? Well, if I squint, I can see people. They look like blobs, globs, like trees walking around. Really? Yes. Okay, says Jesus. And this time, once again, the Scripture says, he touches the man's eyes. And now ask, can you see now? And the man says, whoa, yes, I see everything clearly. Now the question is, what is this? What in the world is, is this Jesus on a bad day? I mean, there's no other incident like this in the Gospels. We already saw the attitude that was in the boat and that he, pardon me, had as they landed. How would you describe it? Frustration? Exasperation? Don't you get it? What in the world happens to his healing powers in this moment? Well, like so many other things in Scripture, if we just pay attention to the context, we begin to understand more fully. So I would go from there to the immediate passage following. The very next story, Mark 8, this one beginning in verse 27 says this, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. In Matthew's telling of the account, Peter says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds, Blessed are you, Simon, son of John, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. It follows immediately on the two-step healing. Jesus pulls them aside there in Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi was a religion museum. 
It was there in Caesarea Philippi that different religions were in the air. The Greek religion was there. The Greek god Pan was believed to have been born there. Syrian religion was in the air. There were many altars and leftover altars to the god Baal. So many, in fact, that at one point in time it had been called Baalinus. Even Jewish religion was in the air because it was believed that not far from Caesarea Philippi was the birthplace of the Jordan River, that river so rich in religious history for the Jewish people. And Jesus comes to Caesarea Philippi, stands silhouetted against the religions of his day, and turns to this motley crew, the ragtag band of disciples. And asks, who do the people say that I am? And the disciples answer, well, they're not sure, Jesus. They think maybe John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus, they're not exactly sure who you are. But make no mistake about this, they think you're great. They can see you. But they just can't see you distinctly, clearly. It's as though you're a tree walking around. There's uncertainty about your identity. And Jesus says, so they think I come from God, do the work of God, and on a mission for God. They agree with that. And they say, oh, yes, Jesus, they think you're great. But they just don't believe I am God. No, Jesus, about that point, the chart on the wall gets blurry. They're not sure who you are. And so Jesus, with a sweep of his hand, wipes away the opinion of all those who have spoken. Because the reality is, to be mistaken about his identity can be fatal, can be funny with us, fatal with him. And the reality is you don't compliment God by calling him a great man. That's no compliment to Jesus. Jesus is different from me. I am far too often more concerned about my reputation than I am about truth. Jesus says, it doesn't matter to me what the reputation is, who they line me up with, who they think I am. If they're wrong on this one central question, then all is lost. So you, he says to the disciples, and in the Greek, the construction is emphatic on the you, but you, who do you say that I am? Enter Peter. Blustering, blundering Peter. Foot in his mouth, Peter. Answering questions that have not been asked, Peter. Enter Peter, the one who for all of the times he has had it wrong, this time hits it bullseye, dead on, square. He says, Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of John. That didn't come from you. That came from him. Those two questions have echoed down through Christian history. Can you see? Then who am I? They continue to echo all the way down into the 21st century, all the way to Lombard, Illinois, where the question gets pressed home to a conference called The One. And you, Jesus asks, can you see? What do you see? Read on the wall. Can you see the letters O-N-E? Can you read them? Can you see? And if you can see, then who am I? Now, we have had the answer to that question woefully wrong, even when we think it's right. I tell this, I've told it at home in Loma Linda. 
I tell it here because it illustrates to me how fuzzy, how hazy, how indistinct the image of Jesus can at times become. It was a seminal moment in my life, May 26, 1987. Pardon me, 85. It was the day of my ordination to the gospel ministry. I was walking up to the auditorium where the ordination service was to be held with Anita, who would soon be my wife. I was feeling overwhelmed, uncertain. I was convinced of this call on my life, but by that time there had been experiences and times and moments when I had become very well acquainted with sin. We knew each other on a first-name basis, though in public I pretended I didn't recognize sin. So as I walked up, I was convinced of the call. I was equally convinced of my utter unworthiness for it. On the way to the pavilion, a pastor had been in ministry for years, stopped me, said, aren't you being ordained today? I recognized him as a leader in our conference. I said, yes, that's how. He said, how are you feeling? I said, well, a little bit overwhelmed, to be honest. He said to me, well, let me share something with you that has helped me a lot in my ministry. True story. He said to me, I have discovered that if you take a paper clip and you put it behind your tie, attach it to your shirt and to your tie, it will hold your tie in place. But nobody can see it, so nobody will criticize you for wearing jewelry or being ostentatious. I said, well, thank you, or something like that. (laughs) And we kept walking. Before we reached the pavilion, a second pastor stopped me. Also a long time in the ministry, also a leader in our conference. And he said to me, aren't you being ordained today? (laughs) I said, yes. He said, how are you feeling? I said, well, not as good as I was a minute ago. <laughs> how are you feeling? I said, well, I'm overwhelmed. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great call. And I'm just keenly aware of how deeply unworthy for it I am. And he said to me, you're right. You are unworthy. But you will stand there today clothed in the robe of his righteousness. You will stand there not because you deserve it, but because he called you. Not because you are worthy, but because he is. And don't ever forget that, and God will bless you. Now, I know I shouldn't divulge names without permission. But that second pastor, his, his, his friends called him Maury Vinden. Maury's son, Lee, is here today. And I just want to say to Lee publicly how deeply influential his father's life was to me and how it continues. <laughs> How it continues to echo even today. Now I know, I get it. I know the temptation is to disparage the first pastor. To put him down. Because we hear his attitude. It's an attitude that says, yes, I know about Jesus. I know about Jesus, yes. But let me tell you what's really exciting in ministry these days. Paper clips. That's where it's at. That's the exciting new thing. I know there's the temptation to disparage him, but please, we wouldn't disparage someone just because they can't see clearly. 
We wouldn't stand there and say, what's wrong with you? Why can't you see that chart on the wall? Something wrong with you? We would just realize they need help. We would just realize what you need, Pastor, is a second touch. A second touch from the hand of Jesus, a second touch that does not just allow you to see what is physically before you, but that allows you to see who he is, what he stands for, what he will do with a life that has been broken by sin. You just need a second touch, the second touch of Jesus. And isn't that the reality of our church? This church that we serve, this church that we love only because it loves and serves Jesus, isn't that the reality that we need a second touch? You have experienced it. I have experienced and encountered it. You know exactly what it's like. A young woman comes to you and sits down in your office and says, Pastor, I just don't think Jesus can accept me. She says, I've been around the block and down the hall more times than I can tell you. I don't think that he will honor me. And you sit there and you say to her, but his word says, Jesus says, the one who comes to me, I will never reject. And she says, but pastor, you don't know my life. And you say, I don't need to know your life because I know his life. I know what a second touch will do to you. A second touch will open your eyes to the reality that Jesus does his best work with broken people. Have you met an Adventist, a Seventh-day Adventist in need of the second touch? A man comes to you, a man who in the words of my friend Calvin Thompson has been raised on industrial strength Adventism. (laughs) And he comes to you. And he says to you, I just don't know. I just don't know what's happened to our church. What has gone wrong? Don't people understand that unless you achieve last day generation sinless perfection, unless you achieve that, you will not enter the kingdom of God. And you ask him the question of the songwriter, where does Jesus fit in? And he says, oh, he's there. He's a part of the process. But as you get closer to the end time, somehow he grows more blurry, more indistinct. He looks like a tree walking around. And you say, oh, but you must have a second touch because wherever the second touch of Jesus has been, there is crystal clear clarity about his role about his unending role in our lives. Have you met an Adventist in need of a second touch? You stand at a graveside. Stand next to a widow, heaving shoulders. The others have slowly filtered away. And you know that in her heart she's delaying this moment, the inevitable moment of walking away for the last time. You put an arm around her shoulders and she says to you, Pastor, just pray, just pray that somehow, somehow I'll be faithful, somehow I'll be ready. Because if I'm not, I will never see him again. And you say to her, you know, sister, his word says that the one, the one, the one who began a good work in you will, will carry it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. And she says, I just don't know if I can do it. And you say, but sister, the word is clear. Let me say it more simply for you. Jesus says, what I start, I finish. That's Jesus. You just need a second touch. 
a second touch from his hand that will open all his glories to you, that will allow you to stand by Simon Peter and say, yes, I see you clearly. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, my hope and my life. Have you met an Adventist who needs the second touch? I go back to those early days that early world in which I grew up, steeped in morality and too often in secret sin, knew what was right, no will or power to do it. I go back even to those earlier days and realize so many times the hazy, blurry shape of Jesus was there, but something was missing. You remember the questions? Even when we were small. What do you want to do, they asked us in Sabbath school, when you get to heaven? What are you looking forward to? I want to ride a lion. I want to slide down the neck of a giraffe. I want to ski on the sea of glass. Those were our answers. Now, I don't know. Is it the passage of time? Is it the theological books I've read? Is it the two children Anita and I have raised? Is it the gray in my beard? Or is it? Is it? Is it that somehow, somewhere, one day, Jesus touched me for a second time? Because if you ask me that question today, what do you look forward to in heaven? Oh, I will answer you. And I will answer you with the words of a song. But it won't be the Adventist blues. No, I will answer you with the words of the B.J. Thomas song. It says, I've never seen the Eiffel Tower. I've never seen the streets of Rome. I've never seen the world's seven wonders. But I'll see the greatest wonder that day when I go home. Because I'm going to see Jesus. I'm going to see Jesus. I'll see him smile, open his arms, and walk my way. I'm going to see Jesus. I'm going to see Jesus. I'm going to look into his eyes someday. Gracious God, we are here today just waiting for the second touch. The second touch, God, that will open our eyes to the magnificent, the matchless charms of Christ. Lord, in your mercy and by your grace, touch these sin-sick souls that we might see. In his name, amen. Randy, thank you so much. That's um, good words. Okay, we have a lot of questions that have come in. Um, Let's start with this one. What specifically is the second touch of Jesus practically? The thing that strikes me about the story of the blind man is that the blind man was powerless to bring it about. The second touch came for him realizing that he was totally at the mercy of a power outside of himself. That try as he might, work as he might, expend effort as he might, he could not bring about that clarity. There was a sense of waiting, literally waiting on Jesus, just waiting for his action. So I think the second touch I know in my own life, and I think in the lives maybe of friends gathered here, comes in that attitude that waits and that says, Jesus, you you know what I need. You know what I am. You know who I am. You know the, the difficulty, the challenge, the sin in my past, whatever the case might be. And I, I just wait here for what you would do in and through and with me. 
And I guess that's why it saddens me so deeply, and I say this with respect, but it saddens me so deeply that the disciplines of the Spirit are under such attack Mm. because that's how Jesus comes. Yeah. That's how he, that's what he does. Yeah. That's how he gives us that second touch. Okay. Um. How does a second touch happen for a sick and nominal local church? (laughs) Well, I think the one thing we can do, certainly as ministry leaders, as members, as pastors, the one thing we can do is just continue to hold Jesus up, just to hold him up in his matchless charms and his reality and who he is. Just continue to talk about Jesus. Uh, As we continue to do that, I, I, I know how it affects me. Uh, Carl Hafner, my son Austin, and I, and we saw some of the others of you there, were at a church just a couple of days ago here in the Chicago area. And we sat and listened to a sermon that just stirred our souls. And and it was a sermon, it did two things, to be honest. Carl and I were talking about this. We looked at each other after the sermon was over and said, what are we doing? (laughs) Who are we kidding? I mean, that is the most elevating, the most depressing thing all in the same moment Mm -hmm. because it sets such a high standard. But you know what happened? I walked away from there saying, Jesus, I just want to represent you better. I want to do anything I can so that you look good. And I think maybe if we hold Jesus up in front of our people, it will have that same effect on them. So, I, I mean... Jesus all. Yeah, amen. This one's a little different. Um, My pastor seems immovable with the very legalistic picture he has of God. I don't think he has ever shared a grace-filled picture of Jesus, probably because he's not, this is not his understanding. How do I share a second touch with my pastor? Well, you know, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that pastor because especially in my earlier life, there was a rigidity that, the best way I can explain it, it helped hold together what was somewhat of a facade. And it wasn't until an encounter with Jesus on a personal level, a deep level, uh, through the preaching of people like Maury Vinden and others, that it really changed for me. So I think I would say, pray for your pastor. Pray for your pastor to come to a crisis of faith. A point where it becomes either I allow him to touch me or I leave. I can't do this anymore. I know I came to that kind of a point. And pray for your pastor to come to that kind of a point. And pray that he will allow himself to be touched by Jesus. It's life changing. But sometimes it requires that crisis experience to come to that. And, and, you know, I appreciate this, whoever wrote this in that, rather than just giving up. Absolutely. There's a compassion for that pastor, which is, which is wonderful. Um, okay, one last question. Isn't the Jesus of the second touch also passionate about morality? Absolutely. He referenced the Sermon on the Mount. Absolutely, no question. I probably in the sermon should have said mere morality. I, I like what Fred Craddock says. Fred Craddock, through his pen and through his preaching, through a distance, has been a mentor to me. Craddock says, every sermon is a heresy. Every sermon is a heresy because you can't say it all. All you can say is one piece today. And that's why for me, I agree with Bill Hybels in this, the the, the salvation of the world is the local church. And for me, as much as I love what we're doing here and as much as I'm honored to participate, my heart is really in the local church. I crave and yearn for and love the opportunity of preaching week by week over months and years. Because then, even though you can't say it all this morning, you know you'll have next week and next month and next year, and you take a journey together. So absolutely, I couldn't agree more deeply with that. And, and I should have said mere morality, because sure, absolutely, Jesus is for that. But it all comes in balance. It all comes in, in knowing him, in walking with him, and then doing what he asks us to do. I would be very clear, like Dallas Willard says, Jesus is not, in the salvation process, Jesus is not against effort. He is against merit. 
The salvation walk takes effort. Sometimes the deepest effort you will ever expend in your life will be here. But it is never to merit it, to earn it. It's just like parenting. Parenting is not based on what I do. But let me tell you, those of you who are parents, have you expended any effort? But it comes out of that love. You're not trying to be something. You are something. And therefore, out of that love experience comes what you do. I think it's exactly the same in the life of Christ. He is not against our effort. He is against merit. And as we walk with him, some of the deepest, darkest, most difficult decisions will press in upon us. But we make those choices because of who he is and what he's done in our lives. Thank you, Randy, so much. I think there's going to be some yes. I think there's going to be some great discussions right now. I'm, I want to mill around the tables. Thank you so much. Okay, it's time to recalibrate. Get together with your tables and talk.